When we moved into the new house, I suggested to the neighbor that we replace the fence. He condescendingly agreed, and it turned into a battle for control, and then I? When Olivia and I moved into our house a few months ago, everything seemed to be going smoothly. The neighborhood was quiet, the houses were neat, and our yard was a good size for the price. We didn't think much about the fence separating our yard from the neighbors. It was an old wooden structure, slightly weathered but standing solid enough. There were more pressing things to focus on. Getting settled, painting the rooms, and unpacking boxes. At first glance, the fence wasn't a priority. It wasn't until spring arrived that the fence started to become an issue. The long winter had taken its toll, and one day while I was mowing the lawn, I noticed a section of the fence sagging. Some of the wood was cracked, and the whole structure seemed to be leaning slightly toward the neighbor's yard. I figured it needed some quick repairs, nothing too expensive, just a few boards and maybe some reinforcement posts to keep it upright. As I started looking at it more closely, I realized that repairing the fence might not be enough. It wasn't just one section that was damaged. The entire fence was rotting in places, and a quick fix wouldn't cut it. A full replacement was the only real solution. I knew this wasn't something I could do on my own, so I started researching the costs of installing a new fence. I figured it would be smart to coordinate with our neighbors, James and Charlotte, since it was a shared fence. We'd probably split the cost, and it would be a straightforward project. That's where things started to get complicated. I reached out to some contractors to get quotes for a basic wooden fence, similar to what was already there. The prices were pretty steep, higher than I expected for a job this simple. After a few more calls, I found a contractor who could do the job for a reasonable price using lower grade materials. It wasn't the best quality wood, but it would hold up for several years and it wouldn't cost a fortune. I figured James would be on board with going the budget route, especially since it was just a fence and not something like a house renovation. I was wrong. The first time I mentioned it to James, he didn't seem too concerned about the fence. He nodded, said it sounded like something that would need to be done soon, and that was it. A week later, I approached him again with the quote I'd received for the cheaper option. That's when things started to get a little tense. James didn't want a budget fence. He said something about wanting quality materials and making sure the fence matched the overall look of the neighborhood. It was clear he had a different idea in mind. After that, I started researching different options to find a middle ground, something that wouldn't break the bank but would still satisfy James's desire for a higher quality fence. I found a few more contractors and got quotes for fences made from more expensive materials, like cedar or vinyl. The prices were significantly higher, and even the cheapest quote was more than I had initially budgeted. Still, I thought it was worth a shot to show James that I was willing to compromise. But when I brought the options to him, he seemed set on going with the top-tier choice. He had done his own research and was leaning toward a high-end cedar fence, the kind that would last decades. It was a significant investment, and he seemed convinced it was the best option for both of our properties. His reasoning was logical enough. Installing a high-quality fence would improve the overall value of our homes and last longer, meaning we wouldn't have to worry about it for years. But the price tag was hefty, and I wasn't comfortable with the idea of spending that much on something as simple as a fence. This is where strategy started to come into play. I didn't want to seem like I was being unreasonable, but at the same time, I wasn't about to let James dictate the cost of a project that would impact my budget. I had to figure out how to approach this in a way that wouldn't leave us with an overpriced fence. So, I decided to stick with my original plan of pushing for a more affordable solution. I reached out to more contractors, hoping to find one who could provide a high-quality fence at a more reasonable price. My goal was to present James with an option that met both of our needs, something that looked good but wouldn't cost us a fortune. While I was gathering quotes, I started thinking about how to leverage the situation to my advantage. The shared nature of the fence meant that James couldn't just install the fence he wanted without my agreement. It was as much my decision as his. I started to consider whether I could get James to cover a larger portion of the cost if he insisted on going with the more expensive option. After all, if he was the one pushing for a higher-end fence, it seemed fair that he should pay more. I waited a few days before bringing it up again. This time, I presented James with two quotes. One for a basic wooden fence that was more affordable, and another for a slightly better quality fence that was still within a reasonable budget. I hoped he would see that I was trying to compromise and meet him halfway.
but instead, he seemed more determined than ever to go with the high-end cedar option. He even mentioned that he had already contacted a contractor who specialized in that type of fence. That's when I realized I had to take a different approach. It became clear that this wasn't just about the fence anymore. It was about control. James wanted things his way, and he wasn't willing to compromise. I couldn't let him push me into agreeing to something I wasn't comfortable with. So, I started thinking about how to make it difficult for him to get what he wanted. The key was to stall and delay until he either gave up or agreed to a more reasonable option. I began by nitpicking the details of the quotes he provided. I questioned the quality of the materials, the reputation of the contractors he had contacted, and the long-term maintenance costs of the cedar fence. I even suggested that we get more quotes before making a final decision, knowing full well that it would slow things down. James, of course, wasn't happy about this, but I played it off as just wanting to make sure we were making the right choice. At the same time, I continued to push for my preferred option, a basic, affordable fence. I made sure to emphasize the cost savings and the fact that it would still look good once installed. I also started looking into ways to delay the project further, like questioning whether we even needed a fence at all or suggesting that we hold off until we had more money saved up. My goal was to drag things out until James either lost interest or was forced to compromise. The strategy worked for a while. Weeks passed without any real progress being made. The fence continued to sag and lean, but I didn't mind. As long as the project was delayed, I was in control of the situation. I knew that eventually, something would have to give, and I was betting that it wouldn't be me. But James wasn't giving up easily. He started involving more people in the neighborhood, talking to other neighbors about the situation, and trying to drum up support for his side. He even hinted that if we didn't replace the fence soon, it could cause issues with property values in the neighborhood. I wasn't too concerned, though. As far as I was concerned, this was a battle of wills, and I wasn't about to back down. At this point, it was no longer just about the fence, it was about who would come out on top. I had my strategy in place, and I was determined to see it through. With the dispute over the fence dragging on, the neighborhood began to feel the tension. What had started as a relatively simple disagreement was becoming a point of gossip. James, determined to push forward with his plans for the high-end cedar fence, Sutley began a campaign of influence. He wasn't the kind of person to be outwardly confrontational, but his actions spoke loudly enough. He began talking to other neighbors, people who had lived in the community longer than I had, hinting that I was holding up the project and potentially devaluing their properties by allowing the fence to continue to deteriorate. From my perspective, his actions were calculated. He was trying to turn the neighborhood against me, hoping that pressure from the rest of the community would force me to give in to his demands. His strategy was simple. Make me look like the unreasonable party, the one who didn't care about maintaining the appearance of the neighborhood. He wasn't direct about it, but I could feel the subtle shift in how people interacted with me. Neighbors who had once waved at me from their driveways now seemed more distant, polite, but cold. I had expected some resistance, but I hadn't anticipated the lengths James would go to in order to win this battle. In response, I doubled down on my own strategy. If James wanted to paint me as the villain, I would make it clear that I wasn't the one causing the delay. I began focusing on the temporary fence we had erected to hold the line while we sorted out the permanent solution. It wasn't an ideal structure, an eyesore, if I was being honest, but it served its purpose. It kept the properties divided, and prevented any real safety concerns from arising while we worked through the dispute. The problem was that the temporary fence was becoming a symbol of the ongoing conflict. The neighbors couldn't avoid noticing it. It was ugly, hastily assembled, and clashed with the well-maintained appearance of the surrounding homes. It was functional, but not aesthetically pleasing, and it stuck out like a sore thumb. But that was exactly why I kept it. The longer it remained, the more pressure it would put on James. The way I saw it, the more frustrated he became with the temporary fence, the more likely he would be to back down from his expensive cedar option. Still, the tactic wasn't without consequences. I could see Olivia growing increasingly uncomfortable with the situation. She wasn't as invested in the strategy as I was, and the negative attention from the neighbors was starting to wear on her. She didn't say anything outright, but I knew she was beginning to question whether it was worth all the trouble. From my point of view, it was a matter of principle. If I back down now, 
I would be setting a precedent that James could dictate the terms of any future disagreements. It wasn't just about the fence, it was about control. James, however, wasn't letting up. One weekend, I noticed that he had planted a row of tall, dense hedges along his side of the fence. It was a clear message. If I wasn't going to cooperate, he would make sure the fence was hidden from his view one way or another. The hedges were strategically placed to block out the temporary structure from his yard, and they added an air of finality to the standoff. While the hedges didn't directly affect me, they were a clear indication that James was willing to spend extra money to maintain control over the situation. It was a small victory for him, but I wasn't ready to concede. Instead, I decided to take a different approach. I started looking into the rules and regulations of the Homeowners Association, HOA. If James thought he could manipulate the neighborhood against me, I would counter by using the HOA's guidelines to my advantage. I pored over the community rulebook, searching for any clauses or stipulations that could work in my favor. It wasn't long before I found a few loopholes related to temporary structures and maintenance standards that could potentially buy me more time. I submitted a formal inquiry to the HOA, questioning whether James's planned cedar fence met the aesthetic guidelines of the neighborhood. It was a long shot, but I figured that if I could slow down his approval process, I could prolong the dispute long enough for him to lose interest or for Olivia and I to gain enough financial ground to negotiate on more favorable terms. It was all about delaying the inevitable. Weeks passed, and the temporary fence remained. The hedges continued to grow, obscuring more of the structure from James's view, but the issue was far from resolved. The HOA eventually responded to my inquiry, stating that they would need to review the plans for the cedar fence more thoroughly. It wasn't the outright rejection I had hoped for, but it was enough to keep things in limbo for a little while longer. As the summer wore on, the atmosphere in the neighborhood grew more strained. There were no direct confrontations between me and James, but every interaction felt loaded with unspoken tension. Olivia and I would catch glimpses of Charlotte watching from their window, her expression unreadable, but it was clear that the silent standoff was taking its toll on everyone involved. Even the simplest tasks, like mowing the lawn or taking out the trash, became a chore. James would be outside at the same time, deliberately making his presence known without saying a word. There was no shouting, no overt hostility, just the simmering tension of two neighbors locked in a battle neither was willing to lose. I could feel the subtle shift in how we interacted. It was no longer just about who would pay for the fence, it was about who would bend first. Eventually, the HOA scheduled a meeting to discuss the situation, which brought everything to a head. James had submitted his official proposal for the cedar fence, and I had filed my objections. The HOA was stuck in the middle, trying to navigate the neighborhood's guidelines while balancing the interests of both parties. I prepared my case, gathering evidence and pointing out every possible flaw in James's plans, from the cost to the long-term maintenance. I was ready to fight this battle to the end, confident that I could force a compromise. But as I sat there, waiting for the meeting to begin, I couldn't help but notice how far things had come. What had started as a simple disagreement over a shared fence had evolved into a drawn-out, calculated war of attrition. Neither of us was willing to back down, and the entire neighborhood was watching from the sidelines. The fence was no longer just a fence. It was a symbol of control, of dominance, of who would come out on top. The lines had been drawn, and now it was just a matter of who would make the next move. As the weeks dragged on, the fence dispute was no longer just a nuisance, but a full-blown financial battle. What had started as a few contractors' quotes for different fence options had snowballed into a much larger issue. I was determined to stand my ground, but it was becoming increasingly clear that James wasn't going to let this go. He had deep pockets, and his insistence on the cedar fence wasn't just about aesthetics. It was a show of financial power. I began to realize that I wasn't just up against James's preferences. I was up against his resources. After my formal objection to the cedar fence with the Homeowners Association, HOA, I thought I had bought myself some time. The HOA's review process was slow, and I was hoping the delay would give me more leverage. But James, ever the strategist, had anticipated this. Instead of waiting for the HOA's decision, he took things to the next level by filing a formal complaint about the temporary fence I had put up. According to him, 
the makeshift structure was not only an eyesore but also a violation of the HOA's regulations regarding neighborhood appearance and safety standards. I wasn't entirely surprised when the HOA sent us a letter demanding that we remove the temporary fence and replace it with something more permanent within 30 days. What did surprise me, however, was the level of enforcement behind the notice. The HOA wasn't just suggesting that we replace the fence, they were threatening fines if we didn't comply. A daily penalty would be levied if the temporary structure wasn't replaced with an approved fence by the deadline. James had clearly played his cards right, and now I was backed into a corner. This was no longer just about who could afford what, it was about who could endure the financial strain for longer. The fine was steep, and I knew that if I didn't act quickly, the costs would start piling up. It was obvious that James was trying to force my hand. The fines were small enough to seem manageable at first, but they would quickly escalate. It was a classic tactic. Make the situation so financially uncomfortable that I'd have no choice but to cave and agree to his terms. Faced with this new pressure, I started to explore my options. Olivia and I hadn't budgeted for a legal fight, but it seemed like that was where things were headed. I spoke to a lawyer, trying to figure out if there was any way to challenge the HOA's decision, or at least by more time. But the reality was that HOA rules were notoriously hard to fight. The regulations were clear. Temporary fences weren't allowed for extended periods, and the fines were fully within the HOA's legal rights. Any attempt to challenge the decision would likely cost more in legal fees than just paying for the new fence. It was a frustrating realization. While I had been focused on delaying James's plans for the cedar fence, he had managed to turn the situation against me. The temporary fence, once my symbol of resistance, was now a liability. I was faced with two choices, remove it and pay for a new fence, or start racking up fines that would only add to our financial stress. Olivia, who had been quietly supportive throughout the process, was starting to show signs of strain. The money we had set aside for other home improvements was now being eaten up by legal consultations and the looming cost of a new fence. Every day that passed without a resolution felt like another step closer to financial disaster. The pressure was getting to both of us, but I couldn't bring myself to back down. This wasn't just about the fence anymore. It was about not letting James walk all over us. Still, I couldn't ignore the mounting costs. In an effort to buy some more time, I submitted an appeal to the HOA, requesting an extension on the deadline. I cited financial hardship and the complexity of the situation, hoping they'd give us a little breathing room. But the response was swift and clear. No extension would be granted. The clock was ticking, and we had less than three weeks to come up with a solution. James, of course, wasn't showing any signs of backing down. In fact, he seemed to be thriving off the tension. I would catch glimpses of him in his yard, inspecting the hedges he'd planted, as if to remind me that he had the upper hand. His property was pristine and he had already started making plans for more renovations. He clearly had the resources to wait this out, while I was scrambling to figure out how to avoid financial ruin. Faced with the reality of the situation, I began to wonder if it was time to cut my losses. I could give in, agree to James's cedar fence, and split the cost with him. It would be painful, but at least the fines would stop, and we could move on. But every time I considered it, something held me back. The idea of conceding felt like a personal defeat, and I wasn't ready to let James win so easily. Instead, I made a calculated decision. If I couldn't stop the fines from accumulating, I could at least mitigate the damage by finding a middle ground solution. I started looking into cheaper fence options that would still comply with the HOA's regulations but wouldn't cost as much as the cedar fence James wanted. I figured if I could present this as a compromise, I might be able to avoid the worst of the financial fallout. I contacted a few contractors and got quotes for a mid-range vinyl fence. It wasn't as cheap as the wooden fence I'd originally wanted, but it was significantly less expensive than James's cedar fence. I submitted the proposal to the HOA, hoping that they'd approve it quickly enough for us to meet the deadline. It wasn't the ideal solution, but it was a strategic move to get us out of the immediate financial trap. James, of course, wasn't thrilled when he found out about my proposal. He clearly saw it as an attempt to undermine his plans, and in a way, it was. By proposing a different fence, I was trying to regain control of the situation, even if it meant compromising on the quality of the materials. But it wasn't up to him anymore.
The HOA would have the final say, and I was banking on them accepting my compromise rather than siding with James's high-end vision. As the HOA deliberated, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the situation bearing down on me. The daily fines loomed, the tension with Olivia grew, and every interaction with James felt like a silent battle. We were locked in a financial war, and neither of us seemed willing to back down. But even as I made my move with the vinyl fence proposal, I knew that this wasn't the end. There were still more battles to fight, and the real cost of this war had yet to be fully revealed. With the HOA now deliberating on my proposal for a vinyl fence, the countdown to the deadline weighed heavily on me. Every day, I checked the mailbox for a decision, but the HOA was taking its time. The fines for the temporary fence were creeping closer, and Olivia and I were feeling the strain. I had held off as long as possible, and now the looming financial consequences were no longer something I could ignore. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that giving in to James's plan for the cedar fence was a defeat I wasn't willing to accept. As the pressure mounted, Olivia began to voice her concerns more openly. She was frustrated with the stalemate, and the financial burden was taking its toll on our relationship. While I had been focused on the battle with James, she had been quietly calculating how much this dispute was costing us, not just in money but in time and stress. Our initial budget for the fence had long been blown out of the water, and every extra dollar spent on lawyers, HOA fees, and legal consultations was money that could have been used for something more meaningful. But even as Olivia pressed me to compromise, I couldn't bring myself to back down. Pride had taken root, and at this point, it was less about the cost of the fence and more about the principle of standing my ground. I wasn't going to let James dictate how I handle my property, and I certainly wasn't going to let him think he could win this just by throwing money at the problem. In my mind, conceding now would set a dangerous precedent for future conflicts. If I gave in to the cedar fence, what else would James try to control in the future? Still, there was no denying the cracks beginning to show. The tension in the house was palpable. Olivia and I argued more frequently, mostly about the money but also about the emotional toll the dispute was taking on us. Every conversation seemed to circle back to the same point. Was this battle really worth it? She wasn't wrong to question it. The fence, at its core, wasn't the monumental issue it had become. It was just a piece of property. But to me, it represented something bigger. A challenge to my autonomy, my right to make decisions for my own home without outside interference. Meanwhile, James hadn't stopped his quiet campaign of pressure. The hedges he had planted had now grown tall enough to fully obscure his view of the temporary fence, a symbolic move that reinforced his ability to shield himself from the ugliness of the conflict. His yard was immaculate, untouched by the dispute, while my side of the fence still had the makeshift structure as a reminder of the unresolved issue. I couldn't help but feel that James was slowly but surely pulling ahead in this war of attrition. He had the financial resources to weather the storm while I was fighting to hold on without going bankrupt in the process. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of waiting, the HOA delivered its decision. My proposal for the vinyl fence had been approved, but with one major caveat. James would also need to agree to the compromise. Without his consent, the HOA wouldn't force the vinyl fence as the final solution. Essentially, I had won the legal right to propose a less expensive option, but James still held the power to veto it. It was a bitter pill to swallow, knowing that my fate was now in his hands. I had hoped the HOA would simply approve the vinyl fence and force the issue to be resolved, but instead, they had kicked the ball back to us. The stalemate wasn't over. Now, it was a question of whether James would accept the compromise or push for the cedar fence as he had originally intended. I had a feeling I knew which direction he would take, but I had no choice but to present the proposal to him. When I sent the proposal over to James, there was no response for several days. The silence was maddening, and I couldn't help but feel that he was dragging things out on purpose, letting the fines continue to pile up while he considered his next move. I knew he was in no rush. He could afford to wait. For him, this wasn't about the money. It was about winning, and I was beginning to realize that he was more than willing to outlast me in this battle. Eventually, a letter arrived from James neatly typed and devoid of any emotion. He rejected the vinyl fence outright, insisting that the cedar option was the only acceptable solution. His message was clear.
He wasn't going to settle for less, and he wasn't interested in finding a middle ground. I had anticipated this response, but it still hit me harder than I expected. The rejection wasn't just a refusal of my compromise. It was a statement of dominance. James had the upper hand, and he knew it. Now, faced with the reality of the situation, I had to make a decision. I could continue to fight, risking further financial damage, or I could give in and agree to the cedar fence, splitting the cost and finally putting an end to the dispute. But the thought of backing down after everything I had fought for felt like a betrayal of my own principles. The idea of letting James win, of allowing him to dictate the terms, was a bitter pill to swallow. Yet, at the same time, I couldn't ignore the toll this was taking on Olivia and me. The money, the stress, the constant tension. It was all adding up, and it was starting to feel like we were trapped in a war with no end in sight. Every day the temporary fence remained in place, we were bleeding money, and every day we delayed, the pressure mounted. The situation reached its inevitable conclusion quickly after James rejected the vinyl fence proposal. With the fines piling up and the HOA pressing for a solution, I had no choice but to make a final decision. The cedar fence was the only remaining option, and there was no more time to drag out the process. I agreed to split the cost with James, knowing that continuing the fight would only result in further financial losses. The installation of the cedar fence happened within weeks. The contractor James had hired began work almost immediately after I signed the agreement. The temporary fence was taken down, and the new cedar structure went up smoothly. It was high quality, exactly as James had envisioned from the beginning. Sturdy, elegant, and completely at odds with the original, more modest fence that had once stood between our properties. The project was completed without further complications, and the fines from the HOA were lifted as soon as the fence was installed. On the surface, the neighborhood returned to its usual calm. The fence dispute, which had caused months of tension, was finally resolved. The fines were paid, the legal consultation settled, and the shared fence now stood as a symbol of James's financial upper hand. From a practical standpoint, the problem had been solved. The property lines were restored, the appearance of the yards improved, and the HOA's regulations were satisfied. However, the damage from the conflict had already been done. Although the fence itself was no longer a point of contention, the relationship between the two households was irreparably broken. James and I no longer acknowledged each other in passing. The polite, neighborly interactions that had once existed were gone, replaced by cold indifference. We lived next to each other, but any semblance of community had disappeared. The cost of the cedar fence had drained much of the savings I had initially intended for other home improvements, and the financial strain had been more severe than I anticipated. There were no further discussions about future projects or shared responsibilities between the two houses. The fence stood, but the connection between our homes was severed. The neighborhood, too, was left with a subtle but lingering unease. The dispute had made waves, and though the fence was no longer a topic of gossip, the division it created lingered in the air. The lines had been drawn, and while the fence separated our yards, it also served as a reminder of how a simple issue had escalated into something far greater. The fence was completed, the financial war settled, but at a price far higher than I had anticipated. What should have been a simple matter of maintenance had turned into a battle of control and resources, with both sides paying far more than the cost of the materials and labor. The war over the fence was over, but neither side had truly won. In the end, the conflict over the fence didn't just drain our money. It nearly destroyed our relationship. Olivia couldn't take the constant stress and pressure that kept building up from this never-ending battle with James. One evening, after yet another argument about whether any of this was worth it, she quietly packed her things and said she was going to her parents' house. She needed time to think about whether she truly wanted to keep living with me after all of this. Her decision was a wake-up call for me. This wasn't about the fence or money anymore. I had lost sight of what really mattered. Olivia said she would only come back when I could show her that I've changed, that I've stopped obsessing over small things, and am ready to work on our relationship. Now I'm left alone with my mistakes, and I have to decide if I can fix this to get her back. If you like the story, subscribe right away, and listen to new stories every day. Let us know what you like the most in the comments.